everyone, Michael Shermer here for the Science Salon. This is a special edition of that, kind of an AMA, except I'm just going to do a postmortem postmortem on my debate I did uh, last week, March 30th, in uh, the Seattle area. Actually, uh, a little town called Squeam, S-E-Q-U-I-M, Native American name, I presume, uh, a couple hours north and west of Seattle, so flew to Seattle and had a lovely drive up there, and I debated Luke Vandeweg from Windmill Ministries. So uh, Luke is a uh, theist, Christian evangelical, actually. It was moderated by Justin Beerley, who has a, um, Briarley, who is a um, Brit who has a popular radio show uh, that he hosts. So he was the moderator, and this um, debate will be posted at some point, I think, in the next week or two uh, online to listen to and even watch. I think they filmed it. Anyway, I thought I'd just do a postmortem on this. We were each given 20 minutes opening statements, 10-minute rebuttal, and then a moderated discussion and Q&A with the audience, and then five-minute closing statement. So the question, the debate was, are the miracles of Jesus unbelievable? And, of course, my answer is yes, they are unbelievable. And I don't mean in the ad- adjectival sense of like, wow, that was an unbelievable magic trick uh, Penn and Teller did. No, I mean, they, they mean, is it unbelievable as in you can't believe them? And the answer is yes, of course, from a skeptic scientific perspective, um, miracles are not, not believable by anybody, much less Jesus. And of course, the main one uh, Christians care about is the you know the one big miracle, the resurrection. But I'll get to that in a minute. Uh, so I'm just going to kind of go through my notes uh, that I did for the debate. Uh, I've not written all this up. Um, portions of it appear in some of my books and articles in Skeptic and whatnot. And we've dealt with miracles uh, in Skeptic over the years. Um, but it begins with, what do you mean by a miracle? So... I mean, most people think of a miracle in the kind of colloquial sense of a highly unusual event, as when somebody exclaims, it's a miracle when they won the lottery, or it was miraculous when they recovered from a serious illness, say a tumor goes into remission, something like that, or or as I used in the, the debate, the famous line from the 1980 Olympics when the U.S. Uh, hockey team beat the mighty Soviet uh, hockey team, and Al Michaels famously uh, proclaimed on ABC uh, television, do you believe in miracles? Um, now, that can't be what we're talking about when we're talking about miracles. Christians don't just mean highly unusual events. They mean something more than that. You know, So I went through examples why they don't want to accept that definition, because I can explain uh, highly improbable events. Um, million to one odds happen all the time, because there are millions of people doing millions of things and so by definition, you know, this weird stuff is going to come out eventually. So I start off with the, you know, have you ever gone to the phone to call your friend and the phone rings and there's your friend. Oh, my God, I was just thinking about you and now you called. So you were thinking about me. Must be some kind of karmic thing or, you know, some sort of, you know, Jungian synchronicity or something like this. Well, no. How many times did you go to the phone to call your friend and, and they didn't call? Or your friend called and you weren't even thinking about them, uh, much less uh, thinking about calling them. So if you add up all the possibilities, you you get 100%. So uh, by definition, every once in a while, uh, something unusual like that will uh, will stand out. And you just forgot all the other unimportant, non-connected misses that, that, that don't stand out. Um, or like some back-of-the-envelope calculations I did with uh, death dreams. These are stories you hear where somebody says, well, I, um, you know, I had this dream last night that my grandmother died. And the next morning, my mom called and said, oh, bad news. You know, grandma died last night. Oh, my God, what time was it? You know, it seemed like it was around the time you were dreaming. You know, what are the chances of that? Well, for any one person, the chances are pretty low. But if you do some simple calculations, for example, each of us has on average about five dreams per night. It's actually more than that, but just say five for sakes of this uh, back of the envelope calculation. That's 1,825 dreams a year. Now, let's say you only remember 10% of your dreams. That, that means you recall 182 and a half dreams per year. Well, there's 300 million Americans dreaming. Uh, well, there's 300 American, mi- mi- million Americans dreaming that produces 54.7 billion remembered dreams a year. 54 billion remembered dreams a year. 
Now, sociologists tell us that each of us knows about 150 people fairly well, thus producing a network social grid of 45 billion personal relationship connections. I then took the average annual death rate, 0.008, all ages, all causes. That comes out to 2.4 million Americans die every year. It's inevitable that some of those 54.7 billion remembered dreams will be about some of these 2.4 million deaths among the 300 million Americans and their 45 billion relationship connections. In fact, it would be a miracle if some death premonition dreams did not come true. And as I said, here's an announcement you'll never hear on television. Next on Oprah, we have a woman that's been having numerous death premonition dreams, not one of which has come true yet, but stay tuned because you won't want to miss her incredible story. Okay, it's not an incredible story unless, you know, that one finally stands out. And of course, we pay attention to that. Okay, and, and Christians also, I think, can't embrace the idea that the ancients had about miracles, which they called signs and wonders, uh, which they applied to just about everything that happened, from the ordinary to the extraordinary, from normal births to virgin births, from rain to deluges, from famines to feasts. Clearly, if everything's a miracle, then nothing's a miracle. Uh, so what we need is, um, is some more specific definition of a highly improbable event that also violates a law of nature and it's caused by a deity. Um, so I turned here to David Hume, uh, who wrote a, his treatise on miracles um, in his great work. Um, and he defined it as a violation of a law of nature or in a footnote more specifically, a transgression of a law of nature by a particular volition of a deity or some invisible agent, as he said. He was an atheist, so. In other words, a miracle is an event caused by God. Okay, so what are we to do when we hear a story about a miracle that is highly improbable, violation of a law of nature caused by a deity or some invisible agent? Here's what Hume says. The plain consequence is, and it is a general maxim worthy of our attention, that no testimony is sufficient to establish a miracle unless the testimony be of such a kind that its falsehood would be more miraculous than the fact which it endeavors to establish. When anyone tells me that he saw a dead man restored to life, I immediately consider with myself whether it be more probable that this person should either deceive or be deceived, or that the fact which he relates should really have happened. I weigh the one miracle against the other, and according to the superiority which I discover, I pronounce my decision, and always reject the greater miracle. If the falsehood of his testimony would be more miraculous than the event which he relates, then and not till then can he pretend to command my belief or opinion." Well, we know about 100 billion people have lived and died before the 7.5 billion people living today. Not one of them has returned from the dead, or as I said to this room full of Christians that I was uh, in front of last Friday night, uh, except for one, <laughs> your guy, uh, except I don't accept that. So 100 billion people have come and gone, and not one of them has returned. What are the chances that one of them did? Okay, that is an extraordinary claim, about as extraordinary as I can think of. And what do we do with an extraordinary claim? Well, of course, most skeptics know, as Carl Sagan famously elevated it to a maxim in Cosmos, extraordinary claims require extraordinary evidence. By the way, that was not original to Carl Sagan. Um, this is an, yet another example of quotes migrating up to the most famous person who ever said them or attributed to them. Uh, this was actually originally coined by a sociologist of science named Marcello Truzzi, who was one of the co-founders of the modern skeptical movement. He was actually one of the co-founders of the, the Skeptical Inquirer, which at the time was called the Zetetic. But who's ever heard of Marcello Truzzi compared to the famous Carl Sagan? Anyway, extraordinary claims require extraordinary evidence, or as Hume said, a wise man proportions his belief to the evidence. Okay, so is the evidence for this 100 billion to 1 miracle story of being resurrected from the dead, uh, is the evidence for it extraordinary? No, it's not even ordinary. It's crappy evidence. And we know from, since the 200, 
61 years since Hume wrote that passage, um, that people who recount stories of things they think they saw are terrible at this. Human memory, perception, cognition is not reliable. Our memories, you know, it's not a video recorder. There's no theater of the mind. There's no Cartesian theater in which the little homunculus is in there reporting exactly the high fidelity replication of what actually happened in the world. This is not at all how it works, which is why things like eyewitness testimony in court is so disturbing, just not reliable. And uh, so, for example, there are stories of miracles. And I told this audience this story. About 2,000 years ago, a remarkable man was born in a remote part of the Roman Empire. A supernatural being informed his mother, the child she was uh, about to conceive, would not be a mere mortal, but would be divine. And she gave birth to him in a miraculous way. As a young man, he left home and went on an itinerant preaching ministry, urging his listeners to live, not for the material things of this world, but for what is spiritual. This man collected disciples around him who came to believe that he was the Son of God. And he did miracles to prove his divinity. He healed the sick, casted out demons, and even raised the dead. For these miracles, he was persecuted by the Roman authorities, and at the end of his life, he ascended to heaven. Later, some of his followers wrote books about him. I'm speaking, of course, about Apollonius of Tyana, a pagan philosopher contemporaneous to Jesus and widely known in his own day. In fact, uh, the followers of Jesus were in contest with the followers of Apollonius about who was the one true son of God. It's kind of funny. In fact, uh, then I, I gave some examples from Bart Ehrman's great teaching company course uh, from how Jesus became God. It's very, very interesting that, in fact, as Bart shows, that there were a lot of stories in the ancient world of sons of God, of God's coming to earth and impregnating women, of people going to heaven and becoming gods. Uh, so this whole business of, um, you know, divine sex and and divine children and so forth is was pretty common at the time, not at all unusual. In fact, uh, uh, Ehrman quotes the great church father, Justin Martyr, who was a second century Christian, <clears throat> When defending what he believed about Jesus to the Romans, he told them, When we say that the Word, who is our teacher, Jesus Christ, the firstborn of God, was produced without sexual union, and then he was crucified and died and rose again and ascended to heaven, we propound nothing new or different from what you believe regarding those whom you consider sons of Jupiter. For the Romans, Jupiter was the supreme deity. In other words, he's saying, look, the stuff we believe about Jesus, it's just the kind of stuff you believe. It's just that we think our guy is the one true God, and you think your guy is the one true God. Okay. Anyway, then I went through all the different um, examples of flood myths in the ancient world. Wherever there's a community of people living on a body of water that floods, they have flood stories. Uh, virgin birth myths. Among those alleged to have been conceived without the usual assistance from the male lineage were Dionysus, Perseus, Buddha, Athos, Krishna, Horus, Mercury, Romulus, and of course, Jesus. Consider the parallels between Dionysus, the ancient Greek god of wine, and Jesus of Nazareth. Both were said to have been born from a virgin mother, who was a mortal woman, but were fathered by the king of heaven. Both allegedly returned from the dead, transformed water into wine, introduced the idea of eating and drinking the flesh and blood of the creator, and have been to have been the liberator of mankind. I then went through the different examples of resurrection myths, for example, in ancient Egypt, and then talked a little bit about Joseph Campbell's uh, book, The Hero with a Thousand Faces, about the common sort of hero journey or story in which these are the kinds of elements that come up over and over and over. I call these oppression redemption myths. Whenever a people is oppressed by an oppressive political regime, they they have this kind of destruction starting over, redemption you know, and, and so on. And I give examples of this, like the Native American uh, ghost dance in the 1890s on the plains of North America with the Paiute Indians, um, who, whose culture was just about wiped out. And this Paiute uh, leader named Wavoka had this fever-induced hallucination uh, from God in which he said all the people who had died long ago 
were going to come back and the buffalo would return and and the white man would go away and and so on this is kind of a destruction redemption or oppression redemption resurrection type myth and this one ended quite tragically unfortunately uh, the ghost dance was suppressed by the federal government and in the climax in the massacre at wounded knee very very bad story I also brought up more modern miracle stories. Like, in other words, if Christians believe the miracles of Jesus, turning water into wine, walking on water, uh, raising the dead, and, of course, the resurrection, based on a handful of eyewitness accounts, and they famously make a big deal about the 500 who saw the resurrected Jesus um, after, after his death. Well, of course, it's not 500 different accounts. They have one account that says 500 people saw it. Well, we can do way better than that. In on October 13th, 1917, okay, so it's barely a century ago, in Fatima, Portugal, 50,000 people saw a cosmic miracle of the sun in which the sun began to spin wildly in the sky and it tumbled down to earth, radiating indescribably beautiful colors. It was attributed to the Virgin Mary. Okay, so I did a show of hands. How many of you uh, accept this? Actually, actually, one person said, I do. <laughs> You'll hear it in the, when they, they release this video. It's crazy. Um, yeah, but of course, Christians don't accept that unless they're Catholic and they're really into the Virgin Mary. But there's 50,000 people, and not one story about 50,000 people. I mean, there were 50,000 people that said they saw it. Okay, 1984, Batania, Venezuela. A thousand people saw the Virgin Mary appear near a waterfall. And these were doctors, lawyers, psychologists, psychiatrists amongst uh, the people that said they saw this. Okay, these are educated people, intelligent people, clearly. They saw this, thousand of them. That's twice as many that saw the resurrected Jesus. Why don't you accept that as a miracle? Well, of course, some do. Um, but, but most don't. Most modern people don't accept those. Um, tons of examples like that. Um, and uh, like the miracles of uh, Shirdi Sai Baba in India, um, or just go to Vegas and watch Penn and Teller and Copperfield perform apparent miracles. <laughs> and I mean, okay, so why don't they accept that? And, and the answer is because it doesn't fit their particular um, worldview. Now, of course, Christians will say, yeah, but, but you know, people don't normally go to their deaths uh, after witnessing a miracle, the resurrection, crucifixion, resurrection of Jesus. Well, that's not true. Uh, people go to their deaths all the time in the name of Jim Jones, David Koresh, Charles Manson, Shirdi Sai Baba, Shoko Asa, Asahara, that's the Amshan Rico uh, cult leader, Marshall Applewhite, Muhammad Atta. Muhammad Atta? Uh, these, they did, these people did not know who Muhammad Atta was. Muhammad Atta is the guy that flew the American Airlines plane into the World Trade Center building. I'm quite sure his moral module is dialed to 11 thinking he you know, absolutely was doing the right thing for the one true God, the one true religion, and so on. And if you want numbers, I mean, Christians are always say, well, there's two billion Christians. How could they all be wrong? You know, that, that, that this is additional support for the miracles of Jesus, particularly the resurrection. Well, there's one and a half billion Muslims who believe that uh, Muhammad worked miracles. Here are just a few of the miracles of Muhammad. He split the moon. He caused blindness to warriors assembled at his door to assassinate him. He caused the horse of an enemy pursuing him to sink into the mud. Before the Battle of Badar, he accurately predicted where enemy chiefs would be killed. He quenched the thirst of thousands of his soldiers. He caused two trees to move at his command. He caused a barren ewe to produce milk. He caused it to rain during a drought in Medina. Stones and trees would greet him during his prophethood. He could understand the language of animals. He didn't cast a shadow. He could hear the voices of the dead in their graves. He could heal the sick and cure the blind by only touching the patient. And of course, most famously, he flew on a winged horse from Mecca to Jerusalem to heaven. So I again ask for a show of hands how many of you and Christians in this room believe these miracles. Of course, they don't believe any of them. And they got tons of eyewitnesses. Um, or just take the Book of Mormon. Again, the first page of the Book of Mormon is an affidavit signed by the 11 followers of Joseph Smith. We saw the gold tablets with our own eyes. Okay, Christians, why don't you accept that? Of course they don't. Anyway, then uh, in the discussion period, I was asked, well, what would it take, Shermer, for you to accept a miracle? 
And of course, I said, well, assuming Penn and Teller and Copperfield aren't in the room for me, because you know, they can perform seeming miracles, and that's just magic. Something like growing a limb back on an amputee. You know, just take some Christian soldier returning from Iraq, he's blown his legs off uh, in an IED, and in the room with the cameras rolling and so on, somebody does a laying on of hands, prays to Jesus, and the legs just grow back. I would be impressed. That would be, again, assuming not a magic trick. Uh, that would do it. I would consider that miraculous. Now, salamanders can do this. Why can't God do this? All right. Anyway, that's that was the kind of the synopsis of my um, my opening statement in the conversation in, in the dialogue. I use this example because Luke brought up, well, he brought up the book of Luke. And he thinks the Gospels were actually written by people named Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Okay, no Bible scholar thinks that. Very few, I should say. Uh, but whoever wrote Luke... Um, apparently was a fairly good historian, or at least that's what Luke says. Okay, I'll, let's just grant that. His example was Luke took this trip through the Mediterranean on a boat, on a ship, and he accurately described correctly, you know, the, the kinds of, the, he used the right kind of nautical language, and he accurately described the places he went to. He correctly described this island that they, they touched down upon and, and so forth. He was a good historian. He was an accurate historian. So when Luke says, you know, I saw Jesus, I mean, I saw the risen Jesus, uh, we should take him at his word. Okay. My counter to that, along the lines of extraordinary claims require extraordinary evidence, I recounted my trip to the debate. So I live in Santa Barbara, so I took the plane from Santa Barbara to San Francisco, but it was delayed. Mechanical problems, so I had to rebook another later flight, and then I you know, got to Seattle just in time to make the two-hour drive to uh, Squim for this debate. And I fortunately had, had somebody, a guy named Bob, pick me up, and we drove straight there, and we went uh, you know, down around through Tacoma. We went across the famous um, bridge, that, uh, that Narrows Bridge that that uh, collapsed in the 1930s under uh, the force of wind because it wasn't stabilized right. We went right across that newly constructed bridge. And then we were on Highway 16 and then Highway 104. And then right when we connected to Highway 101, the last stretch to uh, this town, a bright light came up over our car and we were abducted by aliens and taken to the mothership and the mothership whisked off to the Pleiades constellation where I met with the Pleiadians. And they told me all about the problems on Earth and that we have to get our stuff together, nuclear weapons and so on. And then they brought me back. And thanks to the technology that they have for time travel, I didn't lose any time. And we still made it to the bait on time. Okay. How many of you believe that we were actually abducted by aliens? Okay, no hands go up. How many of you believe we were actually driving across the Narrows Bridge and on Highway 16, Highway 104, Highway 101? All hands go up, okay? The travel details are ordinary claims that don't require very much evidence at all, just ordinary evidence. The alien abduction story, that's an extraordinary claim, and it requires extraordinary evidence. What kind of evidence do I have? None. My word of mouth, that's all I have. And my friend Bob, <laughs> who went along with the story, I, I think. <clears throat> so that was kind of, I think, the I think a very telling moment there. And he said, "I have to agree with you that that that's a good analysis. At least I think that's what he said. That may be a false memory, uh, but I thought it was a good analysis. Uh, again, when we're talking about miracles, most of the miracles we have from history, um, the uh, the evidence is anything but extraordinary." Now, I can't prove that miracles didn't happen in the past because it's kind of like the problem of proving a negative, very difficult to do. But the burden of proof is not on me to disprove the miracle claim. The burden of proof is on the miracle claimant to provide extraordinary evidence for that extraordinary claim. And as we know, they don't have extraordinary evidence. They don't even have ordinary evidence. So therein lies the problem. So that was it. That was uh, my experience. It was fun. Um, I, have, I have to say, whenever I meet with Christian groups, they're always un 
unfailingly polite and nice. They pray for me. They want to save my soul and all that. It's great. It's very nice. Um, and, uh, you know, so, but you know, still, I, I think they're wrong. I think it would be better if they rejected the supernatural altogether. Maybe think of the, if they just really need to be Christians for whatever reason, they, it's a meaningful worldview for them, helps them get through the night, whatever. I understand that. Um, and I encourage them to read people like, um, uh, Ken Miller, my friend, Ken Miller uh, and his book, Finding Darwin's, Finding Dar uh, no, no, it was, uh, Darwin's Cathedral, I think it was. Anyway, um, Ken is a Catholic and, um, uh, and he says, you know, this is what, this is my belief. It's my belief tradition. Can't prove it. My friend, Martin Gardner, one of the co-founders of the modern skeptical movement, called himself a Vidyist. He believes in God, believes in an afterlife, believes in prayer. Can't prove any of it. Says the atheists have better arguments, slightly better arguments. He said, um, okay, I really have no brook with them. I, I'm, I'm not going to, you know, get into a d big debate about them because they don't want to debate. They're not, there's no claims being made. They're just saying, this is what I believe. Okay, fine. So I encourage this group of Christians to just think of it like that. I mean, if you mean metaphorically, we all have to bear our cross uh, or or mythically like a Joseph Campbell or, or maybe a Jordan Peterson kind of thing that, you know, the hero myth it helps us uh, be motivated to fight back against political oppression or something like that. Okay, that's fine. I get that. But you know, when we're talking about scientific claims of actual miracles, no, the evidence is just not there for that. Yeah, so that was my conclusion. Okay, so that uh, that's the postmortem on this debate. It was fun, and uh, and when they release that, I will post it. But for now, you have this little reenactment of it. All right, so long, everyone. <laughs>